solution where you try to offer um, and so basically that you can you can increase probably the cost of your offering but then because you are you are um, you are satisfying more needs than what you're doing actually right now so okay so are you um, just philosophically inherently saying that the, the cheapest solution is never the more value optimized solution I mean, is, is this bad, is, is what I'm saying. Is, yeah, is yeah. If, if we have companies that are um, developing products that are cheaper and cheaper, yeah. and as a result, people are buying those products, is that a bad thing? I think, um, I think that what should be the, uh, I think if, if you want, uh, I think that even if people are buying more products, the, the purpose of offering products and manufacturing products and delivering products should be always to, to satisfy their needs. And so if you are, de if you are, um, if you are developing a cheaper product, then probably uh, the quality maybe could be worse or, um, or they are not actually giving, they are not uh, satisfying their entire, how to say, they're probably just to fulfill. They're just probably to satisfy. They're just satisfying. How to say? Maybe a function, but they are not actually delivering a total experience to the customer. And so, for me, then it should, it should, it shouldn't just be about cost cutting, but it should be to deliver more value. That is kind of looking at the entire customer experience. And we can see that many actually many companies in Europe, in the Western world, actually succeeded by actually. Avoiding focusing on the cost cutting strategy, but also but try to look at more delivering a a whole customer experience, and so that actually people. Well, one example is the example that people make is always the iPhone, <laughs> because when it came first in the market, it was costing like six hundred dollars, if I remember correctly, and then but then it was satisfying, it was providing a whole experience to the customer, and then it was targeting many needs that probably you couldn't think they could be satisfied by a phone and they were targeting those needs um, and so actually at the end uh, to me to me is a good thing if you think from a from a company perspective but if you think from a uh, from a customer from a customer point of view then the purpose of companies should be always to satisfy their entire customer experience and then in their turn, they will gain more. Uh, okay. I know, no, I think, I think that's good. And, okay. and so we, we, we start with a bit of, of a philosophy there. But mm -hmm. I think that's good because I think it sets the stage yeah. for basically for your work. So, um, so as I was going through it, th see, this is a very different thesis for me coming from a more um, hardcore mathematical engineering yeah. background. And here's a, a methodology empirical quantitative one. Yeah. And, I, and I find this really interesting. And so you use words like, <coughs> like you're trying to um, increase, you know, a, a shared understanding of the customer needs and expectations. Um, and in your first, you, you talked about your research questions in your yeah. presentation. And so you talk about you increase the design maker's awareness about the value of design alternatives. And um, so from from my engineering background. You talked a little bit about this in your presentation, but how do you quantify an increased awareness? <laughs> yeah. How does that translate? Yeah, I think uh, this is a little bit what I try to do with the experiments. So to try to, since it's very, so very difficult to be able to quantify the engineer's awareness, so to try to quantify in my research what could be prox proxies that, they, that, that you could say that the engineers are increasing their awareness. And so these proxies are, for example, if we, if, as we saw in the experiment, is the time that you increase um, the discussion about the problem rather than just developing a solution. And so if you're increasing the discussion about the problem, there is uh, a body of literature that is saying that this is, will increase the awareness when you will take the decisions. And so I think you need to find, from your research point of view, you need to find proxies because the awareness is very difficult to define, but then at the same time, to 
I, I didn't want to write in that my my aim of the thesis is to increase the total time that you spend discussing the problem because then it's not targeting a more um, a more holistic perspective. So if you want to measure that, then you need to find proxies. But still, for me, the aim of the thesis should be should be a little bit wider than what you can exactly measure and the proxies that you, the measurable proxies that you can find. Okay. No, and 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 I agree with that, and it, and I think it was. It was clever for you to go out and find the references that say, "Look, if we spend increased, increased time and increased, um, increased time at this stage, the product development is good, um, and you can measure that, which yeah. is nice." If, if you take that to its logical conclusion, however, um, does that result in a better product? Spending more time up front from your research, uh, can can you quantify that? Is it a better product? I think what they wanted to do with the, yeah. I is, think is there any literature that supports that maybe? That, that more, spending more time up front understanding the requirements, even whether or not yeah. you label it value, results in a better product? Right? Well, there is a research uh, in front loading problem solving that is, dealing, that is dealing with this issue. And so it's basically trying to. Okay, if we front load and if we give more information about the problem and people are getting a more uh, thoughtful discussion and conversation about the problem, then this will generate uh, in better decisions and hopefully, because you are considering probably the entire life cycle and you are not just going manufacturing and usage, but you are looking more into, okay, how this product will be in the end of life, how this product will be, and so, and so if you are increasing, then it will have more what they call life cycle quality of the product, so that you have a product that it has more value through the entire life cycle. Um, okay. No, 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 yes. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, so let me jump. Again, it's, it's, it's an interesting conversation. Um, wait, on, on page 23, you talk about value engineering in part of your yes. background research, and you say that VE studies are very challenging to initiate in the early phases of a project. I found that statement interesting because to me that's logically where they sit. So can you comment a little bit on, on that statement? Why are VE studies more challenging to initiate in the early phases? Uh, I think what they found, uh, what they found in, in those references that, uh, that they put in the the literature is that, it, is that they are saying that this requires an entire an entire knowledge about the product that that you are that you are developing. So basically, you should be able to break down the product that you are having into the elements of this product, and then also not only the product that you have now, but all the products that you are thinking that you are developing. And so this is very challenging in conceptual design because it can be that. I can have the concept that I want to do this, but I still don't know yet what I'm going to put in this. And the value engineering instead is looking into, okay, then you have this thing into this, and these are having a relationship that is like that, and you can map it, and you can. But when you are trying to think about a concept, and many radical concepts that are so different, then you will have to spend time and to go into, and to map all the functions that you have with the, these radical concepts. But then it means that you are still making detailed decisions about them because you are still mapping the details of this product. And so it means that basically you, you do not have time to consider all many radical products, but probably you can focus on two of them and detail them in, uh, in detail, and then you can do the value engineering framework to understand what will be the differences. Okay. Okay, so let's, um, let's talk about systems engineering. Yeah. And the, the, the reason, I, I want to spend some time on systems engineering because mm -hmm. this is the framework that, the accepted framework we have in place right now yeah. um, for complex product design. So um, you make a statement that in systems engineering, uh, the, it, that the, the problem of modeling value is exacerbated because of the difficulty to easily map the interrelationships between subsystem properties to the overall system value provided to the stakeholders. Now, you're, you're throwing value in there. But yeah. I would argue that a systems engineer would disagree with that statement. Mm. Because a, a pure, a pure dyed-in-the-wool systems engineer will say, if I know what my product wants to do, and I do my, my requirements flow down properly, and that's yeah. the key thing, is to be able to do it properly, yeah. um, 
then it doesn't matter that people don't understand what those top systems are requirement. All they need to do is optimize towards that flow down requirement, mm -hmm. and because the process is in place, they'll automatically optimize the top thing. What, what, what are your feelings on that? Yeah, I think, yeah, my, my views changed a little. Um, I think that when I wrote it, I, I wasn't properly formulating it, I can say. So for me, um, is as you said, is to do it if you look at the systems engineering, uh, the ECOSI manual, it, it is perfect. So, I mean, you are doing this requirements cascading modem, as you said, if you do it properly. And this properly, it will, what for me makes a difference, because for me then, when you are cascading down these requirements, you have the problem that the engineers that are working at the lower levels, they do not have, they do not have a clear understanding about what are their needs and expectations to be met. And so, but there are so many aspects that probably are not flown down, uh, are not uh, are not cascading yeah, down yes. in the process. So the problem is to do it properly and then I think this is where the, this is why for me these value modeling approaches they are not replacing systems engineering but they are complementing systems engineering. Okay. So to make prop this properly as you as you said. Uh, okay, so if we could do it yeah. exactly correctly and we had these beautiful requirements that were flowed down is it necessary then for the the engineer sitting over in the corner working on the sub 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 system yeah. to understand about value and top level requirements or can you know if they if they were given a really lovely set of requirements according to systems engineering not according to, to value engineering yeah do they need to know about top level requirements or top level value uh, I think so, because if you have like, a, because it depends on the system that you are considering also. So if you want to deliver more value, then you should consider also the systems that are above the system that you are considering. So if you are, so you you may have the fact that you have a a, a system that is above the system that you are considering, for example, an asphalt compactor, and so you will need to get a wider understanding of what is the system behind that. That could be the construction project. And then out of the construction project, probably there is uh, the authorities and uh, the, how to say, that the society in general and the environment on the top of that. So you still, there are still many aspects for me that probably are not included in, in, the, requirement, in the requirements that you receive because probably they are cascaded down from the system that you are considering. But there are many aspects of value that are depending on systems that are above the system that probably you are considering. And this can make a huge difference if you want to make a better design. Because if you want to make a more environmental friendly design, then you probably need to consider even what's beyond that specific system. Okay, okay. So let's see, there we go. Um, yeah, so that was, um, okay, so I, I found this interesting. Um, you have a, a value centric thesis and you spent a little bit of time talking about different definitions of value and you even alluded to it at the beginning, but you've never actually said what you think value is. How would you define value and what are the important things? Yeah, to me, to me the value, to me value at the end is, all, is, is, is so the purpose, if I look from, a, from an engineering perspective and what should be the mandate that the engineering design should have. If looking now, we are. I'm probably a little bit too philosophical, but the purpose that you should have is always to to satisfy to satisfy people's needs with your design. And then, uh, and then for me, value is that's why I wrote this maximization of the needs because you should always try to max maximize the fulfillment of the needs, but also try to find out the new needs that could be satisfied with your design. So for me, one aspect of value is that one, and the other one is instead trying at the same time to look at the resources that the customer will have to spend to meet these needs. So to me, at the same time, you should maximize the, the, the needs that will be satisfied with your solution, with your concept, let's say. And then at the same time, trying to minimize the resources for both the customer and the environment. And that's why I wrote my definition also, maximization, minimization, because there is never an end. So this was more probably I'm too philosophical here, but I think the mandate of um, so those maximization and minimization were intending 
the fact that there is that there is never an end for an engineer to to think about value. Philosophically, even if you are satisfying the needs that probably you have collected from the customer, maybe the, you should go and find if there are new needs that aren't satisfied or haven't been expressed, and so then to translate them into the. So it's more like a process also need finding that is kind of related to that. And at the same time, you have the resources part because at the end, uh, especially now that we have that, uh, we have this factor, it was four when I start, when I studied, now I think it's 10, that you should reduce the environmental impact of our product. So it was four, I think now it's 10, probably it's 20 now. I don't remember, but, uh, but, um, but so basically you should always try always to think uh, about reducing the resources to satisfy the needs. Otherwise, we may have a product that is satisfying needs and probably costs very less, but then it's but then it's, uh, has a very very bad impact on the environment. So at the end, this kind of in the long term is degrading the fact that people will satisfy their needs. So that that's interesting that you, that you you use the word resources instead of cost because in your thesis, all the definitions that you did were a value for cost type of thing, yeah. and you're very it seems you're very specifically using the word resources instead of cost. Are you equating resources and cost, or are you not? No, that was the purpose. And I wanted to write actually expenditures, mm -hmm. because that helped me to even to broaden this definition. So from the cost to more okay environmental impact, time, effort. But then I didn't like too much expenditures because. I don't know. Yeah, that, that implies cost as well. Yeah, like exactly. Monetary cost. So the idea at the end, I use it resources because then a resource can be time, for example, it can be effort, it can be. So that's why I use the term resources instead of cost. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's see. Any So um, moving on, when we're really trying, to, when we're really starting to get into to the meat of what you're doing. So we're talking about your methodology. Yeah. And you make a statement that your first paper showed that designers must have the ability to capture stakeholders' expectations and needs and interpret them to understand why they value the solution. And then you go on to say in paper B that. Um, engineers that when making decisions on alternative solutions, engineers justify the selection of a particular concept referring to the ad hoc evaluation criteria adopted in decision meetings and gates. Um, I think that happens sometimes, but I think especially, you know, like I'm over in the aerospace world, that um, design decisions are made purely on performance and capability numbers, which um, gives lie to your statement that there's ad hoc evaluation criteria. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, for me, I think that the phrase ad hoc evaluation criteria is not really so what I what it was what they meant to that is is actually what you are saying is that what they want to say is that those ad hoc evaluation criteria are actually uh, performance numbers and manufacturing cost numbers. So what they want to say that these evaluation criteria right now are mainly uh, are mainly in terms of um, performance requirements and manufacturing cost. And probably there could be some something related to regulation, for example, uh, could be. So. So are you inherently saying that value can't be translated into a technical requirement? No, actually, no, no, yeah, no, uh, no. Uh, so what I want to say is that. What I want to say right now, so what I want to say there is that now you are considering some aspects of performances, but then you are, it's very difficult to translate other aspects of value that could be translated into a requirement, but since now it's very difficult to be able to translate them, then they are not present when you're taking, they're not present in the stage, in, sorry, in the gate, when you're taking the decision. So basically everything, because to me, ideally you could translate uh, all the aspects, all the needs into a requirement, even image, for example. Mm -hmm. It could be translated in the fact that you have a rounder, you need to have a rounder shape in the asphalt compactor, in the engine hood, for example. But that, right now, is not, 
it's very difficult to be able to translate. And so when it is, the current situation is that in these meetings, they are not, so some of them are present and some of them are not translated as requirements. I think, I think a pure systems engineer would, would mm -hmm. disagree with that statement because they would say we do that using the flow down of requirements process. And again, going back to the airplane world, if you look at the illities, and you talked about the illities, yeah. maintainability, reliability, those are traditionally translated into things like failures per hour or things like that. So um, can you support the fact that, that it seems that, that you're saying that these things are not being taken into the traditional design process right now? No, I think that they are taking into the process, but they are not cascading down. The, okay. They tend to cascade down very late in the process because you need to okay. translate many times. So at the end, if you want to start the development earlier, so if I want to develop a solution, if, I, if I'm developing the drum and then I want to understand what will be the impact on this drum on the environmental impact, I will need to kind of to, to get the required uh, now probably the environmental impact is not right. Uh, I'm thinking about if I want to develop, if I want to consider many concepts, and for example, if I want to design for image, let's say, probably there will, there will be a requirement that will come down to what image is for the drum, but that will come kind of late in the process. So when you're starting, if you want to start a developer earlier because you want to save time, then you will uh, then you will have to ask okay what's image for uh, the drum and then they probably there will be a flow down of a requirement that they will say that the drum has to be in a kind of a shape but maybe when there is the interpretation problem has been refined and cascaded down to the to the drum then maybe this this requirement is completely different but you have already maybe the started the investigation on the drum that is satisfying the requirement that you received earlier no, that, that, that's actually a, a, lovely, um, a lovely way of looking at it because as, as you're talking, what's, what, what I'm hearing is that there's a loss of, of translation, there's a loss of transparency between the yeah. original intent yeah. of the requirement um, when it gets down to the person who's actually making a decision based on that requirement. That's nice. That's quite nice. Okay. Um, let's see. So, so going back to value then, it, and <coughs> I'm going to come back to this, but do you fundamentally believe then that value can be measured quantitatively as opposed to qualitatively? I think that in conceptual design, the, the idea would be to translate all these value aspects into a monetary definition. But the problem is that in conceptual design, you do not have much data and information. And so you're starting with, yes, ideally, you would like to quantify everything. But when it came, uh, we had a, a, had an example in the in paper, in, in the final paper, my thesis, where we tried to quantify all the aspects, uh, all these value contributions of this subsystem. But then at the end, it was very difficult to be able to quantify everything, because how you can quantify an impact on for example, there was okay the, per the perception that the driver could have because this is giving more the impression that you are stable. This is very difficult to judge and quantify. Yeah, yeah. Probably there could be that. I think that still, to ha this is why I came up with this um, combination of a qualitative group and a quantitative group to be able to handle both of them. Probably in the future, this could be a first step to try. So the idea with this, the qualitative loop and the quantitative loop, is that the qualitative loop helps also to enable the future quantification of these aspects. Because probably, if you are setting that there is a relationship between one characteristic and value, the problem is still, in this project, you, you still handle it with, through discussion. But then you start to recognize that probably there is a way to quantify this aspect. And then you start to trigger the discussion about, OK, how can we we, how can we get the find an equation for this? And maybe you can start, for example, to uh, to try out a test with the with probably drivers, for example, if you're talking about that perception, and try to understand if there is a benefit, like in the fuel consumption, or uh, so. Right now, I'm handling it with a qualitative loop and a quantitative, but probably in the future. But then I think we are. 
this will take really years to be able to quantify all these value aspects. No, no, and, and, and I agree, and I think this is probably one of the most difficult aspects about dealing with, with yeah. a, a value framework. Um, let's go back to something you said is that you agree that everything needs to come down to a, a monetary value function, which again is supported by, by Colby. Yeah. You know, and um, and and I tend I tend to personally disagree with that. So uh, what what are your justifications for it always coming down to a, a monetary value one? Because before you used the word resources very clearly, yeah. and now you're saying no, no, it, it does come down to money. So how how do you reconcile that? I think at the end uh, the use of a monetary function is more to is more to help designers to engage into a single domain. So it's more to okay, we have all these resources and we have this need, but so how can we how could we identify them into one single one single monetary definition? And then if we are not able to quantify them, then we then we have the res then we have other then we need other measures that are supporting us to take a decision about those aspects that we are not able to quantify. But still the fact of going and quantifying is helping you to kind of refine your assumptions because then you're trying to think about what kind of function and what kind of relationships you may have between these aspects. And um, so, so the monetary function is not used because I think that the difference between what Colopy has written and, and my work is that Colopy is looking at using these functions to, to enable a monetar to enable an optimization of a design. Yes. Yes. But for me, uh, for, w for the research I've done, in conceptual design you're not exactly interested to, to, to see what is the optimum because there could be still a solution that is out of the model that you developed that is probably better than the one that you're trying to optimize. So you model something that is giving you that the optimal is one specific value, but then there maybe there is an option that is out of the design scope, the design space that you have been able to model. And so here, the, but still the monetary definition here helps you to, to engage the stakeholders in, this, in, in a single domain. So try to quantify these aspects into us. So still, again, to have like a, something that is in common and it is kind of considering the different different aspects of and try to quantify that to define the assumptions that you are making to make this model and so to understand if there probably is a solution that is has a completely different impact uh, on this mm -hmm. I, um, I I agree with you that having it, it provides a common language and a common yeah. framework for people to communicate and that's important and I, I agree that um, you know, Colby's justification for this is everybody understands money. Everybody understands the minimization. Um, I would argue that if you monetize things, that, that two things happen. And the, the first is that, um, you, again, you reduce transparency. For example, um, if you're trying to reduce um, environmental, or reduce environmental impact, and you turn that into the monetary function of what are the fees yeah. that you incur if you don't meet that, you inherently lose transparency. Yeah. And the second thing is I think it works against what you're saying in that um, if you're trying to have people understand the difference between value and cost and then you turn value into cost, then it mud muddies yeah. things up again. But what, what do you think about that? I think that still um, Scamp <coughs> monetary. I think that this is why the methodology I developed this qualitative loop to be able to kind of grasp these softer aspects that that, that are not that you are not able to quantify. So the idea is to have a monetary definition, so to engage stakeholders to because they they kind of understand money, but also to help them to understand factors that are not related to money, uh, like. Yeah, as we said, for example, environmental impact or uh, benefit for the society and so on. So that's why for me, I still believe that the quant just the quantification of value uh, is not the only solution, but there is a combi but probably a combination of both. So to have something that engineers can understand, they, they can 
but also at the same time to have these measures that are looking into more the qualitative or the perceptional aspect of value. So I think at the end it would be, uh, there is a combination of both. And, and I found that interesting because I conceptually like the idea that you're moving from a qualitative to a quantitative thing because I think that mirrors the design process. Yeah. And, and I like that. But I, I do have to ask, if you're using a qualitative value statement or value judgment or value definition for the first part of the process and then a quantitative one for the second part, first of all, what happens at that boundary? And second of all, aren't you inherently changing your definition of value and thus inherently changing the decisions that will be based upon that? I think that the idea is to first <coughs> the idea with the, those two parts is basically is on the entire process. So it's not for me the use of the value model is not on the decision that you are making at the at the end of the process, okay. but it's more what you have done before and especially what you will do after the meeting. Because for me, conceptual okay. design is not like as we are doing a decision like at the supermarket that you have three products and then you, you see which one for you has the highest value and you pick that. Because you want to understand in conceptual design how you can improve that one. And so in this, in this process, that's why for me the transition helps you to start first to make explicit your assumption. And then you try to quantify these assumptions that you kind of try to verify along the process to the far, that's why I wrote in the thesis to the farthest extent as possible. Because this statement was to say, okay, we can probably quantify these relationships somehow, but still there are many that we can't. And so at the end, that's why you have that convergence verification, because you can have that the total cost of ownership measurement is saying to you that something is better, but then probably another concept is better from other aspects. And so you are you have still to consider so why the other why the other concept is better than the other one and how we can improve the concept to have a higher to have a higher value. I don't know if you're I, I think well. so. Or are you saying so are you saying thus that you think the process is just as important as the result? For me the, the process for me the process is really really important in conceptual design. Because what you have done before to define those functions and what, what kind of activities you have done to define these functions and then the decision that you will decide to take afterwards, the decision, the, the decision meeting where you see this, you see the results of the two and then you think, okay, but so now the value model is saying that this result is better than this. But then probably there is something that we, if we make some changes on this concept, or probably if you look at the third concept, then you will have an, a, a value that is higher than that. And so you start to make actions to investigate the concept further. <coughs> this is for me why I think if you want to evaluate uh, the benefit of a value model, it will not just be as, as a, and this connects a little bit with the experiment. So it's not just in the, in the decision, it's not just in the decision meeting that the value model has the most interest, but is before and after. So when you go and sit at your desk, everybody then goes away and sit at their desk, what they are doing after they have seen those results in the value model. Okay, yeah. Let's see. Okay, so on, on page 44, you talk about um, that uh, design con concepts are seldom radically new designs. Rather, they're often derived from the improvement of an existing technology, and, and I agree with that. Can you talk about your method and these ideas in the context of revolutionary ideas as opposed to evolutionary ideas? Yeah, I think, I think this is a little bit um, I think that this is a little bit still the, the limitation of the value modeling approach that I developed because it's based on considering the solutions on a baseline, which makes it the fact that you are that you are kind of that you are basing all the design on the baseline that you have. So you you it's very difficult to evaluate really, really radical new design. And this is why in the thesis I 
uh, at the, in the future work chapter. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote about coupling the value models with platform model. Yeah. Because then you start to model the platform and you start to see what kind of different platforms they can be uh, they can be evaluated and so then you can write then you can start to, to to have an evaluation of radical design but i think that i have to say that i haven't reached that stage yet and so i think that's why it's in the future work so well and, and actually i would like to point out that uh, work along those lines is being done at, at georgia tech right now in terms of using physics-based platform models to try and explore some of these spaces okay. so i think you're 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 very relevant there so, um, so that's good. Um, okay, we talked about that. In terms of method applicability, um, do you think your methods and these ideas will work for a for a highly complex system or a, a multi international global type? Corporation that produces a, again, I can use I can use aircraft, but I'm thinking something like spacecraft or things where a lot of different people in different geographical locations yeah. need to come together. How how are your methods applicable there as opposed to in just one company? Yeah, I think that um, I think that here a connection with that would be uh, would be to people that are working with distributed. Uh, distributed collaborative work. So people that basically are looking into how models or how representations are helping. Actually, I think that this can actually, um, this is why you s this concept of the boundary object is basically coming from people that, st that started to see the difficulties in distributed collaborative work. And I think that actually this methodology can, can, be, can be applied in this context where you have many people that are working with different geographic and, and you have a geographical distribution. Um, on the other hand, there is a problem in very, very highly complex uh, products that you have many different companies that are collaborating together. And so the problem with these companies, especially if you are sharing, if you want, especially if you are uh, using a monetary definition for value, there's the problem that you may have that these companies do not want to share the data uh, between between each other, and so you have the difficulty to have to be able to quantify monetarily. Uh, let's say for the the component, then you will probably require some some data from the hybrid system. Say. Yeah, the company that is kind of the system integrator, but then uh, there is a difficulty of sharing data, and so here probably a way to do that would be to use probably you will need to do to use a different uh, kind of approach. So basically like a bo black box approach where you just uh, share qualitative numbers that are still giving, they're still giving the, they're basically still giving an impression about what the numbers can be, but still they're not giving the exact numbers. I don't know if I explain. Yes, this. yes, and, and, and I think um, companies sometimes use surrogate modeling. Yeah. yeah they, in places like that. Would you see a place of your value models um, becoming, say, boundary objects between companies in this sense? Could you make that analogy? Or I think so, because uh, at the end you may have There is actually there is um, a, there are some publications that actually already stated that the fact of using models and basically so these cons these um, publications have looked into the collaboration between uh, I think Airbus, Rolls Royce, and uh, yeah, GKN here in Sweden. So basically they already they they have already stated in these publications that the use of value models is helping to have this, uh, this kind of collaboration. What I think my thesis makes it different is the fact that I basically started kind of from this publication because they were, they came a little bit before. We were first. So, <laughs> but basically what is a little bit of a difference is that I added also the perspective that it's not just helping between different companies, but it's helping between different individuals that are working in the team. Okay. So okay. this is, I think, is kind of my contribution is that 
I started from the, the collaborate the cross uh, what's that? cross company that's why I think I wrote it in the discussion I guess that I started so these companies they were looking into cross company collaboration and then instead I, I started to look into the cross functional collaboration within the team so I think that is what makes uh, but there are already publications that are looking into how these value models can have collaboration between the companies so um, as, as part of your methodology, when you move from the, the, the qualitative to the quantitative, you're using, um, you, you talk about um, QFD. Yeah. And, and I found it interesting that you made the statement that you can't do negative correlations with QFD when actually the portion of the QFD that you were using was house of quality. It was, was the little yeah. part of it. Are, are you familiar with house of quality at all? Yeah. Okay. I think so. And then you were, okay, then you, so, so you were showing basically the center of this yes. house. Th there's a roof to the house. Yeah, exactly. Has, yeah, yeah. I, it's just that with 30 minutes it was a little bit difficult okay. to, the problem, so with the house of quality you can map these negative correlations, right. but the problem is that you can't aggregate these correlations and to get the final a final measurement that is saying, okay, what is the total of the house of quality? So in the house of quality, it's good because basically you can map this roof and you can see what are these relationships, but then you can't basically aggregate these relationships into, okay, what is the final number? And then how can you change? If, so if I change this, uh, if I change the engineering characteristic, what will be the impact? And the house of quality just helps you to say, okay, there is a trade-off there, yeah. but it doesn't yes. help you to solve that. Instead, if you're using, that's why I use code at the end, because the code that helps you somehow to play. The roof is saying that, okay, there is a trade-off, okay, so, uh, but what is the trade-off? No, 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 that's fair, that's fair. I agree that um, a house of quality can be a very powerful tool in trying to translate these these illities into uh, numbers that we can understand, you know, yeah. in our targets, which, which are very nice, and help you rank their relative importance. Yeah, because at the end, still, you want, I think that one important aspect is that first, you need to, to make an aggregation of the correlations that you see in the quality function deployment to then go again into the matrix and understand what are the relationships. So at the end, I think you still need one number that is saying to you if concept A is better than concept B. Mm -hmm. Then you can go and to see in the matrix what are the reasons for that. Instead of quality function deployment, you have this, yeah, you have these circles, and, but then they are not really helping you to understand if one concept is better than the other. You're right that it doesn't help one concept, it helps, but it does help you determine which Requirement, if you will, exactly. is more important. Yeah. What about there? So there's been some work then coupling that with things like like a Pew matrix, which does give direction. Yeah. And um, if you combine those two things together, you can develop a value metric that now has weights on it. Yeah. From the house of quality. Yeah. And it'll have direction based on the Pew matrix. Did you look into any sort of Quantitative definitions of value based on these qualitative methods. Um, I'm, I'm getting towards the development of an overall value yeah. function. Okay. Was was that within the scope of what you were trying to do or not? Not really, because my my thesis wasn't really about. If I have to say, the thesis wasn't really about improving the methods in the sense of really try to optimize the methods, but it was more to see what are the effects about the collection of methods that then eventually we can go in and optimize the methods. Otherwise, okay. we would have, have okay. to spend time on defining, okay, what is the perfect, what is the perfect matrix? But the idea in my thesis was more, what, is the, what are the effects if we are trying to use these different methods and what will be, what is the result that they are giving to a design team? Because this can inform people and actually inform also myself because I have an idea of how to go and to improve maybe uh, these different methods. But I think that it was more to see the overall effect of the combination of the methods rather than trying and going to optimize these methods.
Okay, okay. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, so tell me a little bit more about Coda and why, why you chose that particular method and what were some of the other methods that maybe you considered or oh, yeah. Coda for? Um, I think, uh, so I basically consider <coughs> well, product uh, quality function deployment as we explained before. And for me, it had a limitation that we talked about before. And the problem also with the cube map for, and then I, I also benchmarked the, the cube metrics. But then the first, uh, that's why I have, I don't know exactly about these new improvements about, probably I, I should have to, <laughs> but, um, but I used as a reference, so the first, the puke metrics, like by puke in 1991. Mm -hmm. And even in that metrics, it doesn't really help you to, to help, to, to play. So the purpose with the coda is also to play with the parameters okay. of the okay. system. So to become more, so the puke metrics is, is a selection tool, but it doesn't allow you to do simulations which is a little bit the concept behind CODA, is also that you try to do simulations while at the same time you are setting these correlations. Okay, no, I like that. And, and that leads very nicely into there. So you talked about um, using a model, but I don't think you actually ever defined what your, what, what is your definition of a model compared to your definition of a simulation? Yeah. And what are the components? <coughs> Are you are you simulating? Are you modeling? And how does how does differ? I think that the a model for me is a simplified representation of a system. Okay. So you are trying to since the systems are so complex, you try to do some modeling to simplify this complex world in a sense by using a model. So at the end you are making a, a simplification of them and you are trying to make a definition of this complex world that you want to understand. So for me, uh, I think a more, I think that once, then the benefit, for me, my thesis is mainly focused on, that's why it is a model-based, uh, that's why I called it a model-based methodology, not a simulation-based methodology, because for me, the idea is to first, just by defining this complex world, you, you, you understand it because you are defining it. Then the benefit that comes after that is the fact that you have developed a model and probably you can put it in your computer and then the fact that nowadays you can have, you can run simulations at faster pace, then you can run simulations. Mm -hmm. But that's more of a, it's more of a side effect of it. If I, so it's more an effect that comes after the modeling. Okay, so, so, then what does your value model really look like and when do you use it? I mean, you put it in the context of your, of your, of your overall framework. Yeah. What, what would one of these models look Well, for like? me, at the end, it should be that. So in the thesis, I focus on the modeling part. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then, of course, then we, then we run simulations also for these concepts what is the future work of it will be to make. So f for the moment, uh, What are the inputs and the outputs for your model? Yeah. Let's, let's, let's back up there, because the model has to have an input and an output. So yeah. what, what would be inputs and what would be you know, uh, classes of inputs and classes of mm -hmm. outputs for your model? What goes in and what comes out? Well, if we look. Um, if you look at the quality, this the, the coda model, you basically you have the input that there are the needs, and then you have the output that that it is this um, what's design merit for a design. So at the end you have that the input are the needs, or in this case the value drivers. If you just look at the coda metric, so you have the value drivers, so the rank weight. So the input is are the rank weight of the value drivers, and the output is this final design merit for a design. Okay. And okay. in the qualitative loop, instead, you have as input, uh, well, you have different inputs in the, because you have the scenario variable. So you have the, the variables for the different scenarios that you are considering. So for example, in the, in the paper, 
we have different, for example, uh, road dimensions. So that could be a scenario. And instead, you need, you need to have um, the other inputs that are coming instead from the functional model. And the output is this final plot across the one sheet. Okay. And, uh, and that segues nicely into, um, so you're using total cost of ownership. Yes. Can you contrast that with using a, a life cycle formulation? Because I noticed in one of your papers, yeah. you, have, you have TCO over LCC. Yeah. And then maybe talk about how that's different or why you chose that over, say, like the, the surplus value method that, that Colby likes. Yeah. I think that uh, so from from the lead to me total cost of ownership and life cycle cost they are kind they are quite related. Mm -hmm. But what literature is suggesting is that the total cost of ownership is more looking into uh, <coughs> more looking into the user perspective. So it's more looking into not just when the product will be performed but also the other overhead. Uh, how to say that? I mean, other types of costs that could be affected by the product that you are considering, but that they are not related directly to the use of the product. So, in a sense, for example, it could be accidents, uh, it could be like uh, penalties, uh, in such dimensions. So, literature suggested that the total cost of ownership is a little bit dif different than the life cycle cost in that sense. And the surplus value, I think, to me at the end, they are quite similar. It's just that the surplus value is considering the revenue, so it's considering revenue minus, mm -hmm. minus cost. Right. And the problem of the surplus value is that you need to define, you need to get a measure for the revenue that the customer is going to get by the use of a product. Mm -hmm. And that can be extremely difficult. And this comes again to the collaboration. It can, be, it can be that you will need your customer that says to you how much money is getting per square meters of compacted asphalt. And that measurement is very, it's kind of difficult to Right, to but what about revenue to the company? And, and see, that that's the interesting thing I was noticing about total cost of ownership. You're not talk. There, there's no... Point or... Uh, yeah, what yeah. about the money that you make off the product that's now a superior value product? Does that, does that play into it? Should it play into a value assessment or not? Or is that just all about the customer? So if I have to say, so I think this is um, a little bit, it is written in the, in the feedback from the industrial practitioner that the fact that, so at the end uh, it is about, so the total cost of ownership is about the customer and then you may have some aspects of value that are related to the company for example, to have more production commonality and so on, that they could play, for example, in the production cost somehow. And that, but then there, are, there is this uh, revenue for the company, which is kind of missing. And so one of the feedback from the industrial practitioner is that this aspect is kind of missing because sometimes you may have that there are some aspects of value that they cannot be quantified like in a, in a total cost of ownership, but the, the, that probably the, the product becomes more attractive <coughs> to the customers which in turn will increase the sale, the sale, uh, mm -hmm. the, yeah. uh, the amount of sales for the company. And so it's increasing the revenue. So I think that that part is missing. And yeah. I think no, that no, no, I, I think I think that's that's a good observation because um, I, I, because it's, because you're already talking about cost. Yeah. And so if you're talking about cost, you got to turn it around and give give a, a benefit. Yeah. The problem so. is that the conceptual design still. Of course, you would like to have higher, uh, higher revenues, but still, you want to understand if this has a benefit for a particular class of customers. Mm -hmm. So, in order to understand if there is the probability that you will get a higher revenue, so otherwise you're counting revenues, but you are not really making sure that the customers that you are going to satisfy, if the the market segments that you are trying to satisfy, will actually get higher value. So basically, you are making some revenue state some revenue uh, you're making assumptions about revenue but not really making sure that the engineers are thinking about the the value for the customers which in turn will come back to an increase for the revenue mm -hmm. i don't know if i no 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 that makes sense and that and th that leads again very nicely to this idea of um stakeholders yeah. and so if, if you're looking at 
say, say value-driven design is all about including all of your stakeholders yes. up front. And again, um, in the aerospace industry, this can be very relevant because normally what we do is we have the manufacturer build the aircraft, toss it over the fence to the airlines who operate it, who toss it over the fence, and then you have to yes. dispose it. When design decisions here are coupled with operating decisions here, but there's a big wall in between. So exactly. value concepts can help make that happen as long as you involve your stakeholders. Yes. So my question to you then is, who are you considering your stakeholders? And how high do they go? How, how, how do you choose who gets to be a stakeholder in these value discussions? I think that, uh, I think that if you look at the, big, at the start of the methodologies that you should collect the cost, the, I'm saying customer needs, but I always, yeah, yeah. I mix them a little bit because it should be the stakeholders' needs. So yeah. you should collect the stakeholders' needs and the stakeholders that you should involve, they are both external and internal. Mm -hmm. So for the external stakeholders, they should be, uh, of course, your first customer, so to say, so the buyer of the product. But then all the other users that that could have, that are not value of the, this product, and one example is really in the construction equipment industry is that you have the the, dry, the operators, they have so much influence for the value of the final product because how they how they use the product really determine the value of this product. Sure. But they are not purchasing the machine, and so they have to be included kind of. So the users. And uh, and I think you should include also, uh, and I think you should include also uh, public authorities. I think, mm -hmm. and of course, then you have internal stakeholders that are that are actually the manufacturer. And probably you should consider if you are an original equipment manufacturer, you should also consider the suppliers that you are, because mm -hmm. it could be that if you're not considering your suppliers and maybe. If you are in a if you are in an industry such as aerospace, for example, that you do not have many suppliers around the world, so if you have the, the supplier all of a sudden disappears and uh, and goes, uh, I'd say, oh, I missed the word. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so you should yeah, consider the fact that that mm -hmm. the suppliers they should survive because they are yeah. giving you yeah. value because. When, if they are disappearing, then, then you do not have components for the system that you are developing. Yes. So yeah. is, is, is that difficult logistically to involve all of these people and opinions in your... Where, where do you stop? I mean, do you need to stop? Yeah. That's, it's, it, that's not easy. Yeah. Not easy I'm, I'm glad you said public authorities. Yeah. Um, where do you see the public? Are, 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 is is the public a stakeholder in most complex products or not? Do you think? For me, the so for me, uh, for me, the public authorities. For me, the public is a stakeholder, but then there are specific authorities that you are considering. So you are considering the fact that. Um, try to find an example. Well, well the, the obvious one is environmental concerns. Yeah. Um, how do you take into account if, if as a planet, we're saying we need to be more sustainable, we need to be more environmentally um, uh, aware? At an individual product and product level, what responsibility do we have, and how does using a value formulation help, help. or does it? So, d does the public, on mass, need to be a stakeholder for, say, environmental concerns for a specific product? Well, I think that the environment comes into play because they. Does a value does a value formulation help that? I would argue that it does. For me, it helps because it helps you to to increase the 
so if you use a value, if you use a um, if you use a value formulation, then you are kind of considering these these stakeholders that maybe are not considered. Uh, that maybe are not considered in the process. That maybe are not considered in the, in the development because probably they are not your first time. You are not your first customers in a sense. Um, Could you put them in your house of quality or in your QFD? Environmental concerns. Well, I think one of the value drivers in, in the experiment, for example, I had one of the value drivers was uh, environmental friendliness, mm -hmm. for example. So the at the end, it would be to kind of translate them into these uh, into these types of value drivers. And when you have these value drivers, they are intended to balance the fact that you have internal stakeholders. So you should have value yes, drivers yes. that is maybe from uh, so, and, and also for example the, that that. Uh, so the idea with these value drivers is that they also should survive for the different projects that you're having. That's nice. Yes. So that's why yes. they are. That's why I use the, the word boundary object because they are kind of surviving for different types of assessment also. So they're not just enabling discussion within one project, but they are they are kind of sticking into the mind of people as uh, as you have different projects and different assessment also. So the idea is that you always have this kind of that's a little bit the ethnographic study that they did in the experiment is that these students they were kind of using always these value drivers to justify and to analyze so how much this is uh, impacting this value driver and how your solution is impacting this value driver so they were kind of sticking uh, through the through the process so um w one of the things that was interesting to me and you just sort of said it a little bit here is that that this is going to survive can you see value models as a way of capturing expert knowledge and keeping it embedded within a certain company or an enterprise? Yeah, th that was the that was why I added, for example, that uh, shadow coda matrix. Is that if you if you use that the coda matrix, for example, you can have to this it gives you numbers, and you can go and, and try to see and play with this function, and you can maybe make a decision about one concept. So we develop this concept, and maybe that concept is going to be delivered. And then in the other, in the next project, we will have to start again. And so we would like to start from what engineers in the past have decided upon value in the previous product. But the problem is that when you go back and you look at the value at the, at the coda matrix, then yeah, they are giving you numbers, <coughs> but you don't really understand what were the rationale. And so it's kind of uh, it's kind of to use as a design. I wouldn't mix too many benefits, but I would say that it helps you to kind of keep the design rational through the process. Um, no, I, I would agree with you there. It definitely would. But that's a sort of a... Uh, yeah. In my methodology, I considered it as an additional benefit. So it was not, not the main primary, focus. Not a primary yeah. benefit. Okay. No, no. I think that's, I think that's fine. I think... Um, Talk about the the experiment that you did. Um, I thought it, I thought it was interesting, and I, and I, I like that you did a very thorough job um, presenting and justifying some of these methods that we don't normally see in typical engineering, um, and th that that was really nice. And I think that you applied them very effectively. Um, so my first question is using students to represent real life. And I know you found that, you, you referenced one paper that yeah. said that um, stu students at the master's level make as good as decisions as managers do. But my question to you then is, have you found anything in the literature? How do you support the use of students? Because you're actually talking about not managers, but designers. Yeah. So is it appropriate, can you defend the fact that it's appropriate to draw conclusions based on a student experiment as opposed to a, a real ministry? Life. I think that it depends also on what kind of students you're using. So in, in, for the experiments, I use that, I use the engineers, uh, I use design students because because they don't graduate, sense. they will not. No, 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 I, I understand completely why they're yeah, they're using something to use. So students, they, they but they were, they were, uh, they are. I think they are still 
in the first in the fifth year of their uh, of their uh, studies. So the fact that you are using them at the fifth year of the studies it means that you have gone through all the courses. And so they have kind of the background of how an engineer could reason. And also they have the fact that they will soon become engineers because they hopefully will go out and find a job in industry. And also if you want to apply, and also I think that using, using students is not the perfect, of course, but it kind of, first it is practical because you have them available. So I, I could use them for three days instead of probably in a company it's very difficult to even get one hour <laughs> if you want to run an experiment. So first is practical. And the second is the fact that they will soon become engineers. So you can assume the fact that they are young engineers. So that they are young engineers for the first year in the industry because there will be some months in between. Uh, and, and the third reason is that if you, if you want to test a method such as such as this methodology, they probably will not apply tomorrow, but it will probably apply in 10 years, then using students that are, you, it will kind of give you the users that they will be, kind of you give you the, the customer, the, the customer segment, that, that will okay. be, okay. that will Make be the one sense. that will be there, so yeah. in a sense, yeah. uh, so, it's not the perfect, but it gives you the it gives you the opportunity to spend the time to define an experiment and to spend time to run it with uh, to students and also to learn how you have to how you have to do such an experiment if you want to do it with industrial practitioners. Because the problem with it to run an experiment is that it takes a lot of time, but the time is not the problem. It's how you actually define how you set up the experiment. So how you decide what do you want to compare, with, and that took really a lot, lot of time for me. Secondly, you need to find what are the proxies that are giving you measurements for the, the hypothesis that you are formulating. So it requires a lot of lessons learned for the experiment, and trying it out immediately with practitioners maybe is not giving to you, probably your experiment is not to be as it's not probably giving to you the same results that they will give if you were trying if you tried it before with students. Okay. So my purpose in this in this seems hopefully I will do research on this. So the idea was to okay first how can we do an, an experiment using students and to kind of see if there is a change in behavior in the design behavior by using a value model and a requirements list. And what, to, what are the lessons learned that I could use if I want to do this experiment uh, with industrial practitioners? Um, to me, the big difference between using students and using a, uh, an actual <coughs> practitioner is simply the level of experience. Yeah. How do you think that this lack of experience might have biased or influenced your results? Or do you think it didn't? No, no, I, I think it, it, it did for sure, uh, maybe. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I think it, no, I think uh, you have to consider the fact that these students are not experienced. But still, I think that they are giving. The, the, so, the purpose of the experiment was not to validate hundred percent your methodology. It was more was more to see if there is a behavior to understand if there is. If there is a change in behavior that is giving you suggestion for to go on with the methodology, so it's not really to validate because, of course, then it would to do a complete evaluation, you need to uh, use practitioners. But still, using students help you to to understand if there are differences in trends. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's fair. Um, but the, uh, the 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 one big difficulty I had with this is when you set up your experiment, you said, okay, here's a set of requirements to your three teams. You go here. Yeah. Here's a set of value metrics or judgments yeah. or framework yeah. here. And then lo and behold, these people spent more time on value and these time people spent more time on requirements. Did you bias your experiment right up front by setting those conditions up front? Uh, I mean, to me, this, the results were not surprising at all because you you led them down those paths, and then your results confirmed that those are the paths they went down. 
So how, how do you, can you talk about that? Uh, I think that still, so, I think that still, uh, what I was trying to do is that I was trying to So I think that the fact that I didn't tell the students what I was looking, what I was looking into, gave them. <coughs> so they didn't know actually uh, what was the purpose. Okay. So, so I didn't give them. Okay, we are going to evaluate if you are going to spend more time uh, here or if you are doing yes, that. Yes, that was definitely what I biased it. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. So that definitely. Yeah. What biased exactly. It. So the idea was I didn't tell them, and I, because for them it was a normal, it, it was a normal uh, lecture day. So the, the activity was okay. You you are going to work with this task, and then yeah, and then they were designing. So I didn't bias them in that sense. Um, what they wanted to do is also that I didn't want to. So I want basically to give the same amount of evaluation. So that's why I use 51 evaluations. So 51 evaluations between the value model and the requirements list. So that you have the same amount, you could say that you have the same amount of evaluations that you could see and look. And then my different, okay, then I will change the logic in which these assessments are made. And so in one I use these requirements metrics and in the other one I use the value drivers metrics. Mm -hmm. And then I try and then I that of course at the beginning of course I had my hypothesis. So for me the XSX criteria for the experiment was this one. Mm -hmm. But it was not that so I did first I didn't advise the students and second I did not bias the experiment itself. So I tried not to bias the experiment itself by maintaining the same amount of evaluations. So the idea was that, okay, you have the same amount of evaluations, and then you're just changing the logic of it. Uh, so th that, that was the, the okay. idea. Okay. I, I, I was interested in that example, okay. because you were, you were looking at it from one point of view and saying, okay, if I do this, you know, well, how much time are they spending in these different activities? Yes. And then there's, there's an implication there that that will result in a better design, although you didn't actually close that loop. You didn't actually say, therefore, more time spent here will result in a better yeah, design. I, but yes. be that as it may, it, it was inferred. Um, solely based on this, could you say then, could you flip it around? Could you say, if I want industry to spend more time doing value-based stuff, then the information that I give them up front will force them into those activities. So instead of giving them requirements to just flat off and give them value, could you see that as a potential outcome or a potential result from this particular study? Uh, the idea was that, the idea with the experiment was to kind of mirror what is, so it was to do a conceptual design activity in a smaller in a smaller scale. So the, because the students, they had to propose, so they had to generate concepts and they had to select one concept at the end. So you were doing, even if it was like 50 minutes, but you were doing kind of a conceptual design in a very smaller scale. So then the behaviors that you are doing, you can assume, of course, you can just assume that the behavior that you are doing in that 50 minutes, since they did the activity object concept generation and selection, that could be seen as a way of seeing that in the entire concept design phase that could take months maybe. So, but but could you could you infer that the type of information and the way you give information to a design team a priori will force a good behavior, which is the consideration of value metrics? Could, could you look at it this way from your experiment? Could you say if I want people yeah. to spend more time looking at value, then instead I will give them a different set of information and a different yeah. set of instructions, and that will force the behavior based on what I saw. That's fair, or do you think that's legitimate or not legitimate based on your? Yeah.
I think that there could be where the experience comes into play. So here, the fact that designers have a different experience, it could be the fact that even if you're giving them different information, but still they are behaving because they are having their own uh, personal experience. So probably, so I would say that, that this will require further investigation because it could be that no matter how information you give me, but still I'm acting as you know, as the experience has told me to do. So that could be um, that could be a problem. Okay. But but the idea with these value models is still that you want to yeah you want to show by showing this type of information you want to change the design behavior at the end. all day, but, but I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, what was the most challenging part of your thesis, of this whole work? The most, the most challenging part? Yeah. <laughs> well, I would say that the most challenging part of my thesis was actually to master <coughs> all the methods that are, that are needed. So the fact that, you are, that you're working in kind of a conceptual design, so that you're working with with something you can't really you can't quantify because you do not have a database that you can, can play on. So this means and there are so many social aspects and this is why the thesis became so related to the social aspect. The problem with it if when it started is that they didn't have the proper tools and methods to run qualitative research in such a context. And so the most challenging part of the entire period was actually to, to <coughs> learn these methods and then learn them kind of along the way. And so the problem is that pro I missed, especially in the first project, if I have to say. So in the first project, I missed a lot of possibility to gather much interesting information because I didn't have <coughs> the right tools to collect. I didn't know the right tools to collect the data and to analyze the data. So I think that in the entire process, it was the most challenging part was actually to master these kind of qualitative methods, and then and then I combined them with a little bit of quali quantitative methods, such as the protocol analysis, and that was also a learning process. The most challenging part was the I think the research process itself, rather than rather than anything else that we say. Okay. Um, one, one final question. Yeah. Did you take a value approach to your whole thesis? Did you apply the value principles when you were working through your thesis? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. Can you figure out what your requirement, your value requirements are? I think that, I think that I used a value, a value approach because I, I start, I had my, I had my idea of how what this what should be the mandate of engineering design. So and that was not maybe that ideal world that I had in mind was not actually the one that I that I was exp that I was not probably uh, always matching the information that I was gathering of the current situation in industry. And so then I could match the current world with my ideal world. And so, and how could make a change from this current world to the ideal world? So I think I used a, a value approach because I was kind of looking into, okay, what are the needs and expectations, but not of, of just engineers of today, but also the engineers of tomorrow. And probably what are the needs for the people that we use the products that engineers would make. So this created kind of, and then I, I think I started, I think it's in the introduction of my first paper, uh, that they started with the fact that you should uh, of these environmental concerns. So I started from the beginning of the research with this, especially because here in the PTH we have this, uh, we have many people that are working with this sustainability. Too, so I was a little bit influenced also by the <laughs> fact that products are not just made to, uh, to perform a function or to reduce costs for a customer, but are also produced to to also to contribute to the final sustainability goals, I would say. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed your thesis, and I, I really enjoyed yeah. our, our conversation. <laughs> that was good. Thank you. Enjoy that. Thanks. Cool.
Thanks Massimo, uh, thanks Damien. So now the members of the grading committee have opportunity to pose questions to the doctoral candidate, Massimo. Please. Maybe you should allow Massimo to have a glass of water or something before we continue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that you did it. <laughs> so, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for the presentation and thank you for both of you for a really nice discussion actually about it. I will continue uh, almost where you stopped. Uh, I'm particularly interested in um, the claims that I found in several places in your dissertation that today this decision criteria is intended actually to change designer cognitive behavior. Yeah. That is also my particular point of interest and uh, from your photographic study we find out that you choose the proxy uh, as a time to actually to understand how they are spending their time on activities. If you return just if you can return one slide to set up the for this one. This one. Just to set up the context uh, I have to say in particularly what I would like to to discuss with you is did you consider any outcome based actually measures instead of just the time because there are some recent studies uh, studying innovation process or redesign process taking into account the sequence of activities, the yeah. interactions and the understanding yes. of the different boundary objects and then uh, measuring what is actually or how the behavior works based on the outcome of yeah. activities instead of just yes. using the time as a proxy. Did you have a did you think about maybe some other other proxies that are outcome based like number of ideas or basically we were uh, this is why because so this experiment since I didn't want to since uh, I did these experiments in April then I didn't have much time to to make a, a publication of the experiment a thorough publication of the experiments but then in the also in my Excel file here we counted the number of concepts that they were discussing. So the idea was to understand that the, I found the, some papers that are, that are looking into the originality of solutions. And so they are basically, where you basically number how much, how much a person comes up with a concept and how much a concept that they are describing later is related to the other one. And so you can see the diversity of the concept. So that is a measure that, that I have, but I, I haven't published. Because I didn't want to write a publication that was not going to be reviewed, and uh, and so the idea is to, in general, uh, after the vacation, then I will start. Uh, and then the other outcome is, since the good thing about uh, this experiment is that we did it on a real, uh, on a on a um, on a case in the industrial company that I'm working with, and basically is on the project is basically on re redesigning that small asphalt compactor. So the idea is that the students, they came up with this concept. And what I wanted to do is that to have the, um, a team of experts in the company to rank the concept and to see if the teams that are using the value model, uh, you receive also higher ranks for the design concept that they develop. And so there you could have a proxy for the quality of the product because you have a team of experts. And then here, again, you come with the expertise. So that was, but then I didn't have time yet to do that. It was interesting from these studies also related to what you ask is that they shown that uh, people with more experience have total different style and behavior in problem solving. So yeah. you should maybe really think if you will have a time and possibility to, to do the study, the, the same study in parallel with the students, but also with the, with the professionals because their experience is actually yeah. driving uh, their behavior. And just one yeah. small additional question, if I can. It is related to the effectiveness of the value models as a boundary object. So yeah. we presented results in, a, it was the paper C, I guess, yes. figure four, where you compared the output of the, of the qualitative analysis yes. uh, re related to the requirements, checklist, and value model that yes. you use basically to somehow support your hypothesis yeah. about more effectiveness. But what it can be seen here actually is maybe not not so 
obvious difference because with some of the criteria, the requirement list was graded better, yeah. like uh, for example, uh, for originality of ideas yeah. or, uh, or information provided uh, what the group needs or what yeah. the group needed or the sat or satisfaction with the results. So how you how you would would basically uh, defend your hypothesis because these results are not showing so so yeah yeah well uh, I think I think I I guess I wrote it is that it seems that the teams that the problem with the originality is that they think that it, it could be that since some of the teams so the teams that they I, I think I wrote it here in the paper is that the teams that use the value models they used it also more than the requirements list so some team some teams they were not okay just not that focus let's not focus on the requirements but let's find a very radical solution so they were kind of going radical so probably maybe that they think that would be more original because they didn't follow instructions but then the other teams they followed the instructions containing the value model and so maybe maybe they do not think that they were so original because they they kind of but for me still the success criteria especially working with students that are not so experienced is that you should base on a little bit not much but a little bit on the structure that you use. so i think that the originality here is higher for uh, for the teams with the requirements but it, it could be related to that One last question and the other one is a small curiosity. And uh, uh, you mentioned in your in your thesis uh, uh, that uh, some of the interviews uh, says that there is some lack of communication of knowledge sharing between the designer teams and the marketing department. Yeah. Uh, because not always uh, the needs uh, are to the designer are not clearly known uh, or uh, understand it, but, uh, understood. But do you think that your methodology uh, can help to increase the communication and uh, share the knowledge between them? In a certain way, this is, a cor is a correlated to the capability to capture the knowledge uh, yeah. of, the of the designer or also for the marketing team? Yeah, I think this is, I think this is one of the, of the conclusions, I think, in my, in my thesis, is that by having to use the model, it's not just to model and to calculate value, but the fact that you have had deep people from the different parts of the organization that actually went to, to define what they mean about value. So you can have the marketing. So, for example, let's say that you have an um, image, for example. This could be outside the technical horizon of an engineer. And so then a marketing uh, guy will have to define how this relates to a particular uh, property, but then you will have to discuss with the engineer what this technical property is, and so here there will be the knowledge exchange to be able to define that, and so here there is when when you have this uh, cross boundary. Uh, sorry, <laughs> so yeah. we will help to create a sort of bridge or at least uh, eliminate some gaps of uh, communication. Yes. Uh, the other question is related. Uh, you mentioned uh, in uh, your thesis that uh, there could be some. Uh, um, uh, s some parameter that could be in conflict. You mentioned, for example, if you increase uh, the yeah. power of a machine, uh, increase o uh, what if increase also the uh, the engine, the, the engine the and so on. Yeah. And uh, uh, you, if I understood well, you mentioned that uh, the system, your methodology, can help to solve uh, this type of conflict in yeah. some way. Uh, do you think that your methodology can be integrated with TREES methodology? Do, do you know TREES methodology? Yes. Okay. Uh, can be, because also in that case, one of the objectives is it's to solve, solve this sort of trade-off, of sort of conflict. Do you think that it could be used together? Obviously, this yeah. could complicate the use yeah. of the full methodology, but uh, do you think that could be some uh, intersection <laughs> yeah. or uh, integration? What I think that was is that I didn't want to write so much about the future work chapter, but I think that is one of the next step actually. Because what you do right now in these models is that you have this functional model 
and then you can play with the fun you can play with this engineering characteristic and so you can see okay what is the trade off that we have to do between power and the engine hood yeah. size because otherwise it's hindering visibility but maybe and so now right now what you do is that you find the better trade off between the two but if you do that you can remove completely that trade off by using this the three principles so you have this functional model there but then you can completely okay but then we do not need to find the trade off because you can solve it and so you can apply it. No, because I think this could be very interesting because uh, uh, one of the problems is that with Batrisa you have a lot of conceptual solution to solve some technical problem and sometimes it's very difficult to understand which is uh, the real value, which yeah. of them is able to, m to satisfy most, uh, maximize the satisfaction of some needs at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. I think it could be no, a good direction think, uh, for a future development or your case. Okay, thank you. And congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much for a very uh, enlightening opposition and uh, much of the topics that I had questions about have been already touched <laughs> upon <laughs> and uh, much of it ha has been answered. So I think I will continue on the one that I think is most important and that is uh, concerning this is about the value and value creation in yeah. new products. And we are, when it comes to systems engineering, the complexity is ever increasing. We have been yeah. saying that for I don't know how many years, since <laughs> the 1950s. They probably said it <laughs> earlier on as well. But it is increasing. Um, and I think it's an important contribution to try to find new models for engineers yeah. to perform their work so that they can handle this complexity and also to express, if it's possible, these values. But then the more philosophical question that I have to you is uh, how do you think, and you already touched upon it, uh, in a world where we, we're not in a one internal company, but yeah. we're in the same time in a business situation where several parties yes. are developing together, and we're seeking to reach really creative solutions by engineers. Yeah. Do you think that, um, I mean, you, you base on uh, systems engineering you have models now that try to box the different uh, details in the engineer's yeah. work, but do you think that this can hinder the creativity process if they add yeah. figures and try to measure with quantitative values, um, <laughs> quantitative measures yeah. of the different values? Do you think that that can hinder creativity? Wh what will happen when they start to work according to the way that you do yeah. it? I think one one of the problems that they started thinking that this uh, working with this mod work with model in such a complex problem is that you you make a simplification of the the complex world and when you are making it then you may give to engineers that are working on that the false impression of reductionism so basically that that you are trying to reduce everything into pieces, pieces and bits but i think that the fact that you are trying at least to to simplify it it helps you to tackle and to get a better understanding about what is the what is the um, what is the world, the complex world they are trying to solve. Otherwise, you will you will just try. Okay, so how can we? We have this very complex problem and this very uh, how to say. Um, yeah, we have this very complex problem, and then we we try to find a solution for it. But then we do not have an, a very good understanding about the problem itself. So we try to solve the problem with a radical solution, but then maybe we come up with a solution to that, but that, that is not based on thorough understanding of the complex system. So I think that still, yeah, there could be a false, there could be, uh, there could be a risk for reductionism in this, but I still believe that the fact that you are simplifying a complex problem, but still that you try to find what are the implications of the different elements then helps you to understand the complex system and then to find a solution that actually is a solution for the problem. Yeah. And I think you already answered also that it is important to have the overall um, requirements when you said to break down the systems into yeah, the lower levels but yeah. still to have the importance of yeah, yeah how to build the cathedral yeah, exactly. <laughs> while you're working on a small yeah. piece. So maybe that can Empire. Yeah, the idea with this model is that you should try not only to... Uh, so the idea is that you go back and forth between the solution that you have, the value, the whole overall system level, and then it depends on which system you are considering, but then 
let's say in this case you are trying to optimize a construction project but still considering other actors that are involved and then you go back again to the details of your component and then you go back so the idea is that you always go back and forth between the two and my other part of the question because i had quite a long uh, question okay. Uh, area that is the business side. Yeah. So sometimes you don't want this transparency from the top down to the bottom. Yeah. How do you think that, or, or would this be further research, or have you thought about that in your yeah, uh, research so far? I think that a problem, a problem with this, especially as we told before, especially with the complex that are working on a supply chain, it is that you do not want uh, so. I think it's called the research competition, I think it's called. Yes. So basically you are working in this mode. So you are collaborating, but still you are competing in some markets. So maybe you do not want to share all the information, especially when it comes to the quantitative, uh, uh, to say, yeah, to the quantitative loop, you do not want to share all the information. And a way to tackle this is that, is to use a sort of a black box approach where you ask for the things that you want a number on, you use qualitative numbers. Your partner gives you qualitative numbers that are not giving exactly to you the idea of what's the, the real number behind it, but still they give you the trend. And then you can use this information in your model and then you share the, and then you give the results again. Uh, so in this way. I think the, this has been uh, in systems engineering for a long time, and yeah. also the difficulties of black box and, and uh, reducing and missing some data. But I think yeah. Uh, yeah, you take this a little bit, uh, a few steps further. So I think it's really good. And and also, if I can add to that, I think that the, the here is when the PSS concept comes in, because with the PSS concept, the idea is that you have all the partners that are involved into. So they, they are not anymore, so you're sharing risks and revenues between the companies. And so pro he, this becomes, uh, it could be a more effective way to share also data between them because now they are integrated into the same uh, business offering. So it's not anymore that they are just, they have the, the business side is quite assured because you have this contract for the PSS. And so this will, facilitate the fact that you share data between the companies because you do not risk that you lose the contract the day after because now the contract is quite assured until for 50 years maybe. So here the PSS comes into play because it helps and also it helps you to share data with your customer because then since you're developing a solution for your customer, your customer is more willing to share data with you because now you are kind of, you have this kind of long-term contract. So. I yeah, think and, and it also is that your method proposes a boundary spanning object so that you can find ways to communicate in a better way between management level in the exactly. different business settings and to engineers. So. Yes. Thank you. Very clarifying answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so now it's time for a few questions from the audience. I think especially to the students that have been used in the experience. <laughs> if you want to express your gratitude to us, you can welcome to those questions. Yes, Nolik. Okay, just a basic question. Because you quantify some quantities yeah. which are very, let's say, undefined. They have no any standard and yeah. so on. So you uh, find the solution that you don't measure absolute value, but you yeah. measure the uh, relative values and so on. Uh, and you apply here the statistical model, mathematical yeah. statistical model. Have you considered another model than just a statistical? Because maybe it's a problem with statistical model. Of, is it enough precise to measure something? Because it could be, let's say, quality or Precision and uh, accuracy are a little bit difficult to define here. Did you discuss or consider another model, mathematical model, that can be applied in, in your case? No, I have to say. Well, in the future work, I, I explained the use of using. Uh, well, but those are statistical models somehow because I explain uh, the use of coupling these value models to data mining and machine learning approaches. So basically, to use the data they are that are already that are available. So you have different devices that are continuously logging data and how this data could inform. 
the value models what where to take decisions on and so but they are based on a statistical model so I I have to say uh, I, I mean for instance fuzzy logic or you know this kind of, of mathematics okay. which is quite common in decision making and yeah. there are some maybe in neural networks some other models that can be yeah. also useful just yeah I, I think it could be I think that those ma I think that those methods still they require to make so many assumptions about the so it requires to make to make so many assumptions about how the customer uh, can behave like if using if you're using fuzzy model but no in fact is yeah it could be a way <laughs> Yeah, I, I haven't thought you can much. avoid the precision problem, for instance, when you apply the fuzzy. Oh yeah, you mean like it running a stochastic, uh, more st st stochastic analysis. Mm -hmm. well, I was thinking to do it, for example, for the quantitative loop to show for, I mean, to have a, like a probability distribution of, let's say that you have a customer that uses uh, an asphalt roller. They use like 10% in a small road and like 90% you know, in a very big road. And this road, they can have very different dimensions. And you don't know exactly what this dimension could be because it can be that a customer, a road is like three meters and a road is two. And so basically that you kind of use the stochastic method to inform the quantitative model because you can model the fact that you have, okay, we'll have the distribution of the road, of the road width, let's say, will be like this. And, uh, and this couples with uh, the use of data mining so basically, if you have sensors that are sensing kind of the path, for example, how much you are, uh, how much you are going back and forth with the roller, then you can take this information into the value model afterwards. I don't know if I explained myself very well. But Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Massimo, for this very nice presentation. Uh, I have a question that is related to. Uh, the discussion you had with about resources and social impact. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if you have um, in your models, uh, if you consider or if you capture the, the time perspective and the changes that uh, may happen um, in, in time. Uh, for example, we go for resources, uh, differences yeah. in cost for resources and the social impact and other conditions that actually will influence uh, a long time perspective. Yeah. Well, the idea with building this uh, scenario, I think, the idea with building the, the scenario models is basically that you should, so if you build these scenario models is that you can simulate the different, the also this, how this scenario, how this scenario change over time, I think is here basically. So you have this scenario, so this, I call them operational scenarios, but they are not just operational in the sense how you operate just the machine but also what kind of other factors are involved into uh, the life cycle of the product. And this life cycle it could be the amount of resources that you have. And then once you develop this model, then you can simulate this model. But I have to say that I haven't developed a thorough, uh, 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 let's say, how these factors uh, play into this, these scenarios for the moment, I would say. But the idea with these scenario models is that you simulated the scenarios over, and so you can understand what will be the impacts over time. So here, what the model does right now is basically that you simulate the operational process. So if you, if you have more, if you are working more into, in a road, and instead of if you are working more in an airport, for example, but then you can use the same principles to consider these other these environmental factors and to simulate them. So. Now we have a question here. Uh, as I uh, realized uh, about your discussions with Lady, uh, you said that uh, for introducing the concept, we need so to know some knowledge about the pin, what's the inside. And uh, uh, there is some uh, situation that if, uh, as you experience, do we need to know about the uh, deep details about the in, uh, inside, or yeah. uh, maybe we, maybe if we know about uh, know more about the uh, details in yeah. inside, maybe we get uh, extracts uh, a lot of values. 
that or maybe maybe need funding uh, I inside the concept yeah. or maybe me, uh, we're gonna miss the um, total concept and uh, miss the miss the uh, blue of the uh, the concept yeah w what's your suggestion about that I think that the problem th this is related to the problem of uh, what you do in product development so the thing is that if you want to know, if you need to know everything about the details of a concept, that means that you're not in conceptual design anymore. That means that you are in detail design, and so you are designing on the details. But the problem is that there could be a concept that is probably this one, that is not this one. And, but then to consider it, you have to start very early, but then when you are considering those two, you don't know yet how they will be in the details of them. So here, there is the, the challenge of the, of the research is that you're still trying to understand the value of something which you don't know the details on. Instead, or you can take the other approach that you avoid considering two concepts, you just focus on one concept and you try to understand how you can increase, increase the details, the, increase the value of the details of it. But if you're increasing the, va the, details of the, 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 the value of the details of it, you are not probably increasing the overall value that you are that you are that of the concept. So here the, the research is okay. How can we still how can we still consider value of concepts that are different, but still where we don't know the, the details of them and try to consider many of them. So this is the if, I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Probably one more question from you. Yes, I saw your answer. You are with us now. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, in your thesis, you in, in the future work you motivate the use of data mining yeah. and, and and learning algorithms to further explore patterns. Yes. And since that my field, I, <laughs> I I find it like, quite interesting. Yeah. And also now that I get a um, a more general understanding of what your research is about, I find it like a very interesting um, let's say opportunity to further yeah. this stuff. Um, however, I see that the amount of different uh, inputs that you could get, it's vast. Yeah. Uh, take, take for example, the, the, the little constructing thing into the yes. meeting. The size of the road, the fuel consumption, the yeah. amount of people, the preparation, blah, 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 blah. And also the different um, activities that you did with your students and your research yes. stuff. So my question is, have you been able to identify a sort of pattern just yet for the experiences that you have to in this research? And the thing is, I want to get a better insight of the type of information that the, that the algorithm yeah. will need to deal with. So I think that I think that here uh, it's also a problem about what kind of, as a business company, what kind of data you can actually get. So the problem is that there are so many data out there, but then the problem is how you as a company can get this data uh, safely and also, I mean, uh, efficiently, economic-wise. So one of the things that you can actually do right now is that you can get a lot of data about the operational environment in which these machines are, in which these machines are operating, because you have so many sensors that are already built in this, these machines. And you do, you're not using this data yet to inform the conceptual design decisions. So what you can do right now, like in months, because I would like to do this in months, it would be to try to use some data that are logged into this. And, those, and so you can get information about how much this roller, how much rollers in different parts of the world, they kind of, uh, uh, you know, they operated, how much how much hours they operated and so on, and so you can get information about those. In the future, in the future, uh, if you are talking about the future, then you can probably get into get data that instead are available, for example, for public authorities to understand what will be the overall impacts, for example, on CO two, and so you can use this data to inform the decisions that you are making. If you want, for example, to make a more fuel efficient roller, but this, I think. How, but then here comes again the fact that you need also to change a little bit probably your business relationship between different parties to be able to share this data. But for the moment, I think that the operational data are kind of, are there somehow because you have so many devices that are already logging data. So. Thanks, uh, I take a closing line and I take it with a question. 
different from all the other questions we got. I was wondering myself, why is this book from all you can I think a bit Bible of product development? Among the numbers of books on product development we have read. Uh, I <laughs> promised you a tricky question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I give to... Uh, I think that is the Bible of product development in product development courses here because it's basically it's mainly focused on the fact that you need to have customer value focused. So it's basically a lot, it's not dealing too much into the details of how engineering design but it's more how you can assure that the engineering, that the engineering design activities that you do are confirming to the customer need. Other product development literature, if you take, for example, Polybinds, which is another version, that is really more into the details of how you should do engineering design. Kind of, so they don't have always this loop with the customer needs in focus, or I think. And also I'm another question is, Okay. I'm another, another one is that it is easier to read, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not an answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot for the session. Now the greening committee will meet. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, see you later in the thicker room at the second floor uh, of the JDD. Thanks a lot for this morning. And see you in the hour.